Fermat's last theorem. It's probably one of the most uh, famous mathematical theorems in the world, and I think there are still many people who think it's like unproven. You have to prove it. It's one of those questions that is never answered. Uh, and it was the case for hundreds of years, since 16-something, about 400 years, it was actually unproven. Nobody knew the answer, nobody could prove it. But it was actually proven just about 25 years ago, in 1994. And the theorem is quite simple, that's one of the reasons it's so famous, I think, because everybody can see and can even try to prove it or disprove it. And it says, if you take n bigger than 2, there are no solutions. Like, you cannot have any n, you cannot find a number which satisfies this equation. You can find a lot of solutions for n equals 1 and n equals 2. There are actually infinitely many solutions, and this has been known since ancient times. But take 3 or 4 or any other number there seems to be no solution. You cannot find any n for any x, y, and z that would satisfy this. And this is weird because, well, why not? I mean, it's just, just weird. And Fermat himself, he just wrote this in one of his uh, notebooks. And then he said, well, I actually have the proof. The claim is there are no solutions. So he's saying, uh, there are actually no n, so you cannot find any n that satisfies this. And he says, I can prove this, but I just don't have enough space on the margins of this book, so I'm not going to do it. And we can, of course, give him the benefit of the doubt, because he's like a super awesome mathematician, but it seems like he didn't have the proof. Well, at least, probably not, because the proof that was published uh, by... Andrew Wiles in 1994, the famous actual proof of this uh, theorem, is more than a hundred pages long. And it's filled with most modern, by 1995 standards, mathematics, most cutting-edge mathematical science, and uh, there wasn't, at least that proof couldn't have existed in the times of Fermat, because it's like science fiction uh, by standards of 1600s. So why am I talking about this? Uh, I want to recommend this book. It's called The Fermat's Last Theorem. It's, uh, it's not the description of the proof, of course. It's not 100 pages of proof. Actually, it's not really mathematical in the sense that you don't need to be a mathematician or technically inclined or really good with numbers to be able to read and enjoy this book. It's a, a casual read, and it, of course, gives you a lot of mathematical background, but really gently. It's not a textbook. You don't have to, actually, you don't have to dig in, and it just touches little pieces that give you an impression of what that proof is, and why is it important, and why was it so, so hard. And it also gives you a lot of history, really exciting history, if you can believe it. Exciting history about mathematics and mathematicians who spend their lives, uh, sometimes short and tragic lives, moving the, the ball forward. And when Wiles in 1994 uh, actually proved the theorem, finished his proof, he was standing on layers upon layers upon layers of mathematical advancements since ancient Greece. So this book gives a really good overview of how math went from counting sticks to a hundred page proof that says something as simple as that can only be described in a humongously complex and, and uh, huge, huge and difficult system that is modern mathematics. Now, the area of mathematics that this lays in uh, can be generalized as pure math. Pure in a sense that it deals with numbers that you use to count. So, 
in contrast to algebra, where you deal with infinitely small numbers, for example, uh, numbers that are fractions and maybe infinitely uh, irrational numbers like pi. Uh, pure math, for the most part, deals with countable numbers, integers. And it deals with things that you can count, uh, groups of things, and other structures that you can build around numbers that are simply integers. And it's kind of, it, it's called, I think it's called pure because it's, at least for humans, we perceive these kind of numbers as truly beautiful. Like an irrational number, a number that has infinitely many digits after the comma or after the dot, depending on your country, um, is kind of ugly. It's not ugly, but it's kind of well, irrational. It's not, it's not beautiful in a sense a sphere is beautiful or a square or something rigid and straight and kind of structured. And I think uh, we, of course, have this evolutionary desire uh, to view something kind of beautiful as more important than something uh, not so beautiful, not so rational. And pure math deals with those numbers that you can think of as the real beautiful part of the math that you use to describe the structure of math itself. So a lot of topics that go into the proof of the last theorem uh, of Fermat is from that area of math. It deals with how math can be kind of generated from the basic descriptions of numbers and relationships between numbers and groups of numbers and relationships between groups of numbers and more and more complex structures, but they all boil down to just counting. Counting as in you can have one or two, but there's nothing in between. So this is kind of integer-ish. There are many reasons to read this book. Uh, you won't understand the proof of Fermat's last theorem, so you won't be able to talk to mathematicians about, you won't be, to be able to discuss uh, caveats of, of that uh, proof, of course, because even though the proof is 100 pages long, which is a lot for this, for this small formula, 100 pages of really, really heavy, hardcore math, but it's still compressed, like it's, even though it's it's 100 pages, if you actually decompress everything that happens there, every single thing that is used, a lot of tools, a lot of ideas, a lot of other theorems and, and proofs, if you decompress everything, you will cover like half of the all existing math. It will be like a whole library. That's That's the whole thing. And this is kind of amazing about math. It's It's kind of infinitely scalable. Now, I'm a software developer, and I can only dream of the scalability that is possible in math, because, well, when we build software, when we write code, we also build on top of existing things. So if you take an app, which is like a really simple mobile app or like a hello world kind of thing on a computer, and you think, well, it's, it's a simple app. There is not much code. There is not much complexity. But if you decompress everything that actually happened in order for that app to exist and run, you will see that there are so, so many layers, that like 99% of the stuff is hidden, but it's there. And when we build software, there is actually quite, uh, quite a low limit on how far can we go in this color build. It's, it's, it's a high in sense that it's higher than any engineering structure or any humanly physical structure, humanly possible, but it's still limited. Uh, at some point, the number of levels that you build upon becomes so big, so unmanageable, 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 so difficult to manage that it just, you just fail, you cannot go on. And if you deal with modern software, you might be able to relate because, well, you, you open an app and it just, it's shit, it doesn't, it's, you hate it. And for the most part, the difficulty is not that people who made it were bad people or they didn't care for the craft. They built on top of too many abstractions and it's just unreliable. It's like a shaky foundation with lots and lots and lots of layers. In math, there's no limit. 
So when they build theorems upon theorems upon theorems and they build these layers of abstractions, they can go infinitely far. It's perfect, it's ideal. Of course, when it happens, sometimes it happens that some theorem, well, they, they found a mistake in the proof. So it turns out this was wrong and everything that was built using that, everything that was built on top of that, now has to be scraped and destroyed. But this is a rigid and straightforward process. They say, this is wrong, so everything here is also wrong. I'm sorry, but that's it. In programming, of course, this is wrong, and there are so many caveats about, well, maybe in some cases this still works, and maybe, well, we, we can get around, and it's, it's just messy. And in math, it's so pure and simple and... Simple, not really a good word, but uh, kind of straightforward in this sense. So when they build proofs and they describe this in this book, like how many actually steps from ancient Greek math to the modern proof, uh, including really, really high level math, it's a lot, but it's solid. It's not like they doubt it. And when, if you prove it, so once the, the guy actually finished his proof and put a dot in the end, of course they have to check because it's a lot of information. So they checked, they checked, and they found no mistakes. They actually found a mistake because he actually started and published, uh, the, he pre presented the proof in 1993, I think, and it was a success, but then they found a mistake and he was devastated and he spent two more years fixing the mistake. He thought he's, he's failed, but he actually found the mistake. He, he was... He was able to fix it, and then two years later, he published the actual proof, and boom, uh, he was done. And it's an amazing story because uh, he actually wanted to prove this theorem since he was a child. And uh, it's quite amazing that he actually <laughs> he did it. Like, how many people dream of something as, as a child and then achieve it? And that thing is one of the most difficult things any human had ever done it's it's stupid how 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 difficult that is it's stupid how complex that is it's like he built the universe to prove something as simple as that that semi simple looking as that and uh, the scale of that project is it's like a large hadron collider kind of thing this is a really good book it's exciting it's interesting it's captivating there are many uh it's about one, basically about one person, about one proof, but of course it talks about the history, so it talks about other people and uh, other really interesting uh, stories. Uh, and it's, it's amazing how you can make a book about math that is so humane. And it's mostly about people's desire to understand that difficult thing and to tackle the most abstract yet the most beautiful things they can imagine. So really good book. Try it. Thanks.